Discover the next level in entertainment. Sky Cable's Evo Box is the latest product that lets you access over 190 channels, built-in streaming apps, and more than 5,000 downloadable apps and games. Get yours now at mysky.com.ph slash skyevo or visit the Sky Zones in Ayala Center and Gaisano Grand Mall, Lapu-Lapu. Hi there, I'm Joe Berth Okao and welcome to Power Women. Today we speak with the director of the Center for Public Leadership of Harvard Kennedy School in Harvard University, Attorney Myrish Kadan Antonio. Hi Myrish, good day to Hello, you. Hello Joe, much for how joining are you? Us. Good, good, how are you? Um, Maayura, Maayura. Not it's not winter me. time here in this part of the world, so right, right. we have an unusual 50 degrees uh, Fahrenheit day. So it's been good and sunny, but otherwise, and lots of snow days this year. And I think it might not be too late to say Happy New Year. <laughs> <laughs> Mao, from the last time we spoke. Yeah. yeah, Kamu, how are you? How have you been? Uh, good, good. Uh, we just received uh, quite a good news yesterday. The vaccines have fired in the Philippines, and hopefully the national government will be able to roll out its vaccination program very, very soon. So that's going to be um, good news for everyone, considering we've been almost a year since we first locked down countrywide. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Philippines. that's great. Yeah, and of course, um, may I greet you happy International Women's Month. Thank you for joining us for Power Women. And of course, uh, a good news that we received just today, you are also holding uh, Another position in Harvard, Interim direct, Executive Director of the Women and Public Policy Center. Congratulations on that. Thank you, Joe. And actually, uh, as you speak about International Women's Month, we are actually preparing for our very own March 8 International Women's Day event. And our topic this year is the U.S. ratification of the Convention on Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. As you know, the U.S. is one of only six countries that has not ratified convention. So hopefully we will have a great discussion then. Um, we'll try to invite you all, pero the 13-hour difference probably makes it challenging for you guys to participate in our events here. Yeah. <laughs> but that's a very good place um, to be in for you, I'd like to believe. This new position you are handling at present very honored to be considered to do another role and to serve, uh, to be in greater service at the Kennedy School, especially at a time when women in leadership are, you know, on the fore and front and center with Kamala Harris being just recently elected as uh, the first, not only woman, but also woman of color, vice president of the United States. It will certainly provide a platform for uh, the advancement of advocacy for women and women's rights. Uh, at the same time, also, the Biden-Harris administration uh, have for the first time convened a gender council, a gender and equity council, if I'm not mistaken, also provide, um, you know, a link to what we do for programs for women here domestically and across the world. How can the center impact uh, policy uh, nationally um, in the U.S.? Um, this is a very significant center because it focuses on public policy regarding women. Yeah, so the Women and Public Policy uh, Center, it, its mission actually is intended to advance uh, important research related to women, gender, equity, you know, inclusion, and the advancement of women. At the same time, we run programs that include a political uh, public office training program for women around the world on running for public office. We also have uh, weekly events and um, uh, research fellows from across the world that bring to the fore important issues across the world. For the United States public policy, these research um, that we produce becomes a platform, uh, like um, a starting point for presentation to higher level 
public officials in the United States, you know, people in Congress, the Senate, and then also uh, the executive administration to help set the women's agenda in the United States. Um, as you know, Harvard has a wide network and many of its alumni are involved in both the federal, local, and national government. So these types of you know, intermingling of network together with our research provides uh, a good opportunity to align with um, certain strategic priorities that advance the cause of women. Looks like uh, the year ahead has been cut out for you, huh? Oh, it is still too early to tell, but I'm, I'm just one among a speck. I'm just a speck here in the wide river of everyone doing their good work related to women, men and women alike. And uh, I'm also just very grateful to have the chance to commune with significant scholars that are not only doing important work in you know, the, the topic of women and gender uh, in general, but also women in conflict areas, human rights of women, you know, gender inequity and the intersection work, important issues that we need to address, especially in a COVID and a post-COVID world. Right, right. Okay. Um, of course, we're very happy to see you where you are now and the work that you're doing there in Harvard, um, impacting not only the U.S., but actually the rest of the world. But before you arrive, um, and this is just a trivia, let me begin, uh, because we'd like to know, our, I'd like our audience to know, uh, to get to know you a little bit more. Um, at this point in time, you would have been very active in uh, V-Day activities in Dumaguete City, your hometown. Yes, um, you know, I I started out really, uh, I was born, as you know, and grew up in Dumaguete, spent the first 40 years of my life in the city and was a student leader, met you when I was a student leader, also uh, met you when I was a newscaster for 12 years, 12, at the you, what used to be the only FM station back then. And uh, I think my humble beginnings in Dumaguete and the values inculcated in me, both by my parents um, and the environment that I lived in, were significant in helping me become the person that I am today. But how was it for you, Myrish? Because uh, for us, you're a household name <laughs> back in Dumaguete. Everyone was hearing your voice very early in the morning in the newscast. Uh, you were practically reaping successes here and there. You were basically unstoppable in the eyes of the public. But how is it living in, um, just to give context to those who might be watching, um, how is it living in a city that's a very quiet, uh, small city where everybody knows everybody, with very high expectations of you? How was it from your end at that point? Um, I think one of the things that I try very hard to imbibe ever since I was young, Jobert, is to be the person that I am, um, to be true to myself and to be my authentic self with others. I don't think so much about how others regard me. Um, I also don't think a lot about accomplishments. I am grateful for the accomplishments and the things that come as they come along, but then I move on quite quickly, I will tell you. So to me, to you, you know, I'm, I'm just Myrish and I think it's important to be grounded. I feel that growing up in a city like Dumaguete, that sort of um, has everything that to grow in, to be a holistic person. You know, you have people who care for you, people who can accept you for who you are. It's a very cultured city. Um, you can pretty much read the books that you want. You can uh, grow friendships and relationships and build them to the extent that you are able. And then uh, I think Silliman education, this crossbreed of Catholic, you know, multi, um, I will say, multi-philosophy, multi-ideology, and just a very diverse, inclusive environment has propagated um, some kind of a really that I feel will probably not happen had I not lived the first 40 years of my life. And Dumaguete, although it's small and probably many people across the world don't know where it is even, except for Forbes magazine that said it's one of the top four <laughs> best places to retire. Dumaguete uh, 
is a great jump off point for professionals like us, right? Siliman has an excellent education that almost provides you the grounding for where you would like to go. You become your own person, but then you realize you have to get out of your comfort zone to know how far you can go. It liberty and comfort to do that. So for me, it was just a great grounding where my roots are that I can go back to and always feel like I have a home and be myself. But also it doesn't, it provides like a jump off point to not limit myself. So growing up in such a city and modesty has also been very significant as I moved to the United States, because whether you like it or not, uh, humility, hard work, and compassion also play such a huge role in your professional life in the United States or wherever you are. I agree, I agree. And also back in Magreta City, you were a uh, counselor, city counselor. In fact, if I remember very correctly, you were the first time you ran for city counselor, you were elected number one, if I'm not mistaken. Mm-hmm. Official yeah, resume. and I was the only uh, woman then, and thank you for helping me. Yeah. But, you know, our student <laughs> government friends really significantly helped me uh, win that first election that I had in all my life. What drew you to public service, Myrish? Um, I think I would attribute my love for service in being raised in a home that actually not only breathes, but also lives service. Both my parents are very devout Catholics and my they serve the church um, even up to now. I grew up with uh, my parents also just welcoming into our home people who were in need. Um, we would, naman mi pedicab sa una, we would have our, you know, public transportation and and we, my dad would stop by, I remember, to anyone in the road who needed a ride. So I grew up with this notion of service as it is there for everybody and it is a paying forward for all the blessings that you, you get. Uh, the second thing that draws me to service is really this deep-seated fulfillment that you get when you have extended your hand to someone. And for me, service is as simple as sharing a smile sharing a good positive note, you know, bringing sunshine into another one's life that day. It doesn't have to be this really humongous display of either monetary consideration or effort. You know, every day is a chance to serve others. So that's my second, um, you know, uh, look at service. And, and lastly, for me, it is really part of my life. Uh, all of the blessings that I've received, I could not have if not for others who have given me that. So for me, service is paying that forward. That is how I translate it in my life. Where did you get that energy? Because to us, you were just a ball of energy or everywhere. Um, student government, president, uh, debater, and so on and so forth, organizing activities here and there back in Silliman University, in college. Where did you get that energy from? I just have... I, I, I wake up in the morning and I'm just energized, but don't get me wrong. I have my low moments. I don't normally show them unless, you know, you're very close to me. You live with me. You can ask Jojo what those low moments are, my husband, I mean. But I feel like my role in life and my life's mission over the years has been to bring sunshine and positive energy into the world. So to the extent that I can do that uh, in my true authentic self, I just make my best to do it. Was gender ever an issue to you as far as your endeavors were concerned and are concerned? Oh, yeah. At some, I, I will say not so much when I was in the Philippines. Uh, I was acutely aware of gender only when I entered law school because uh, women, I think um, our freshman batch in the Cinnamon College of Law only had some, like, something like 30 women out of 150 and then we graduated, there were only eight women in my, in my batch wow. and with 30 men. So it wasn't, women were not so much into law, the law school um, if compared to nowadays. It has been, my consciousness of gender has been heightened when I attended international conferences, especially those that are hetero, you know, like a mix of, of several genders, because then you see not only women it depends. If it's a human rights conference, uh, more than 
the conference on anti-corruption, majority are men, you know, so it depends upon the topic. And then in the United States, um, it is very palpable, even in an institution such as Harvard, um, that staff and especially faculty, women, and especially women of color, are such a minority. But that's when I obtain such a consciousness of gender in the work that I do. If you ask me whether it affects my everyday, um, depending on the audience that I'm with, I'm acutely aware when, when I'm in a room with all male faculty that, um, you know, if there's just two of us in a room of 20 males, that our voice tends to be hounded. And it's a challenge to put across, you know, your thoughts. But I think what I've learned through time is to build relationships so that when I come into the room, it is I'm not coming in for the first time and, uh, you know, building a reputation for yourself that you're and also uh, paves the way for for creating a voice for yourself. So it's been so much more of identity politics than of gender politics, I think, uh, for me, uh, just because I'm. I'm the only Filipino in the Kennedy School, and there are very few Filipinos in Harvard at the moment. Was it the same situation for you back in the city council in Dumaguete? Because if I'm not mistaken, you were also the only woman councillor back then during your time. Oh, yeah. I mean, I thank you for reminding me. I totally forgot that part of my history, maybe because I have just, <laughs> I have gone past that and I've forgiven the situation. But yes, when I was elected the for the my first term in the city council, I was the youngest and only woman uh, city councilor, and it was such a challenge. I feel that the challenge was brought forth inherently by being part of the minority and uh, being such a minority in terms of gender. I mean, I was the only 10 elected city councilors, but also uh, because of just the sheer, I will say now when I reflect back, almost immaturity in handling politics. Now, if you, you involve me back there where it's a pool of men, I would know how to handle it better. But then it was really quite challenging because politics of numbers played such a huge role uh, versus, you know, the representation and I will say issues that, that needed to be brought to the fore, especially those that affected the people more. So it was a little bit frustrating for me. Uh, many lessons learned for that first term that I carried with me on my second term that I also actually reflected so much on when I came to the Kennedy School. What are the other lessons as far as public service in general is concerned? Yeah, I mean, the second lesson that I learned was um, a product of failure. In 2011, I ran for vice mayor of the city of Aguete and lost. And I, when I look back at that, exercise, you know, the process of even deciding to run for the second highest position. And then the campaign and all the events that led up to the campaign, both within the political spectrum and the audience, meaning the electorate themselves, at a time when I did not thoughtfully um, articulate my message to the people, my the platform uh, that I had for for them and also um, my plans and, and how I'd like to work together with them. I think before I ran for vice mayor, I was not so much in touch with the people so that when the issue about my master of laws was raised as the only election issue, I somehow struggled messaging that to the people and it was easier for the other camps to actually question that almost innocent enterprise, right? Or, or experience. So in my mind, I think Public service in public service, it is important to be close to the people, to be in proximity with the people you want to serve. So one, you understand what the issues are, and two, you actually create that relationship where you can share and communicate and represent their voice the most. And third, like visiting and being proximate to the people does not only come within elections. It's, a, it's an entire experience for, for the time that you serve and for local government officials for three years. And then the last lesson I will say is, you know, the party is a vehicle, but it is so much an individual experience. I hate the campaign. Um, I don't know if I'm, I'm planning to go back to it in the future, but 
it is a vehicle for service. You cannot really serve the public in elective office without it. So I feel like electoral reform is an important initiative that should be undertaken in the Philippines. And if I have the chance, I would love to be involved in that too. Uh, they say, Myrish, that when you invest in women, you invest in the community you live in or even the society in general. Your thoughts on this? Ah, yes, I remember. Um, it was actually James Amon Agri. He's a Ghanaian. I quote, if you educate a man, you simply educate an individual. But if you educate a woman, you educate a whole nation. I think that his statement has been supported by international agencies. I was just reading in preparation for our Women's Day um, event here in HKS, a World Bank study that actually articulates why this is uh, truism, right? In that study, it said that um, the increase in education of women is correlated to uh, increasing by 18% a woman's future earning power. And because women actually give birth to children who participate in the labor force, if you educate that woman who is the source of children, right? Of course, the man is a good partner. But because the woman um, so births the offspring, then necessarily you will have educated a nation. Yeah, yeah go ahead, please. No, I fully agree with that, but I would okay. want to probably articulate that I would like to advance the thought within a spectrum of a partnership with men. Because um, I think to create a society takes both genders and actually all genders now, there are several genders um, and gender orientations that have cropped up. Has the world really made it easier for women, Myrish? You, uh, the U.S. just elected its very first uh, woman vice president, but also they're saying um, this is a long time coming. Um, uh, Beijing uh, plus female 10. president. Yeah, I, I mean, I will just say, since the time when uh, women were able to vote, up to the time when women had the right to represent you know, their societies uh, in government. There have been strides, but there is still a lot of work to do because the recent data on you and, you and women, you know, that uh, primary international organization that looks at the plight of women that advocates for women indicates that actually um, in just 103 countries that they have done a study with, women's representation in elected local deliberative bodies vary from 1% to close to 50% with a median of 26%. So there are strides in local governments, but as far as the national government is concerned, we hold between three to just 15%. And in fact, countries like the United States that have been traditionally regarded as, as, as advanced has not had a woman president ever since, uh, you know, the Republic or the Commonwealth, how do you call that? Uh, the, it's um, Articles of Incorporation. It's um, the, the Republic has been established uh, versus the Philippines, which already has two women presidents in history. And then there are still continuing conversations on how do you advance increased representation of women, quota or non-quota? Um, and then you have the latest, unfortunately, which also involves women in politics. So there have been strides, but there is still a lot of work that needs to be done in terms of gender parity, not only in representation, but also in wage gap, also in parity as far as how is concerned, um, opportunities in professional life, as well as even in the advancement of human rights in general. Um, good point to make that it has to be a partnership between a man and a woman. Um, you have three boys. By, sorry, I apologize. Four boys. <laughs> Four boys. But um, what have you taught uh, your son so, sons so far about women? Ah, they live with a woman every day, right? And probably a woman that influences them greatly 
add. <laughs> I will want to say that. <laughs> so um, I, I do not circumscribe to an education that is monolithic. For me um, and Jojo, it is important that we raise our boys as global citizens and that they learn respect for all types of genders. You know, there is no specific gender we want them to circumscribe to. We um, endeavor to teach them both by word and example to always be kind and compassionate towards others and to think about how to pay forward all of the blessings that they have received, especially our hemophiliac boy who, if, um, you know, my, my in-laws did not provide us the chance to come to the U.S. and for them to have a near normal life with adequate medication, they wouldn't be where they are today. So these are the values that we inculcate, we strive to inculcate in them every single day. Um, as far as women are concerned, I will want to say because they will have girlfriends, one has had one, uh, or wives in the future. Uh, Georgia and I, by our words and example, also um, educate and hope to train them that it is a partnership and it's important for men and women not only at their professional but also personal lives. And marriage and relationships are so much about understanding mutual respect and trust and always, always to just be kind and respectful, right? You don't lose anything by being that. Very nice. Uh, when you are faced with a fork on the road, Myrish, and your decisions will be affecting other people, what are your considerations in arriving at the decision? Huh, the road not taken by Robert <laughs> Frost. <laughs> um, one of the things that is my automatic lens when I am in the forefront of like a quandary in decision making, especially for important issues, um, not only in my personal, but also professional life, Jobert, if it affects a multitude, my first lens is where are those marginalized and underrepresented, right? Who is taking care of them? Are they factored into the conversation? What effect will this decision have on them? Because the rest can take care of themselves. Two, um, I think for me, I also factor in impact both long-term and short-term. How will this decision then impact the lives of these people and then the lives of others? Because before I even think of myself, I only think of myself into the decision if it's a personal decision. And if it's a personal decision on my end, I think about growth so much more than opportunity. For me, does this position, does this next step in my personal Really provide me room to grow, even if it's difficult. Finally, for today, my Irish, uh, what's your message to uh, the younger women who would like to follow in your footsteps? Wow, I mean, I don't think you should follow in my footsteps. I think you are special in your own right. I think every woman has a right to quality of education to greater opportunity equal to men and other um, genders and sexual orientations out there. And if you don't realize it, there is so much power in your hands. So be that person you want to be, do not. Yeah, anything is within reach. The world is your oyster. Um, there is nothing really impossible with hard work and sacrifice and you will get there. Trust me. It will not be a straight road, but for as long as you work hard and you look straight, you will get there. So good luck. You are beautiful and you are special. Thank you very much, Myrish. Attorney Myrish Kedapan Antonio of the Harvard Kennedy School. Happy International Women's Month to you. And thank you so much for joining Power Women. Thank you also, Jobert, for this chance to share a part of my life. And I wish you all the best, you and the team there at the Freeman Online. And keep safe and best regards to our friends and Kababayans. Thank you and best of luck to you too. Thank you so much for joining us. This is Power Women Season 4.